Your foot is uniquely designed for walking and running. You've got an enlarged tuber calcaneus, which gives your long Achilles tendon better leverage to store and release energy. Your big toe can hyperextend, helping to push off the ground during terminal stance. You've got your plantar fascia, a band of tissue that connects your calcaneus to the base of your toes, which supports the arch of the foot, absorbing impact force during the early part of stance and returning approximately 17% of it during terminal stance to help propel you forward. The foot's 26 bones, about a dozen ligaments and four layers of intrinsic muscles have all evolved to be able to maintain the structural integrity of the foot when it is absorbing the impact peaks of early stance, but that can also become taut to propel you forward. Footwear only emerged around 30,000 years ago. The oldest still preserved shoes date to 5,500 years ago and were basically moccasins with a thin, hard base. It wasn't until the 1970s that cushioned running shoes became mainstream, particularly in recreational running. Footwear was first created as a way to protect the soles of the feet. When bare, the foot adapts naturally, developing its own protective layer in the form of calluses. Calluses are made of keratin, a flexible hair-like protein that is also the primary constituent of rhino horns and horse hooves, so it's very tough. So while shoes are protective, they do come with drawbacks. First, wearing shoes creates a cycle of dependency. It hurts to go barefoot without calluses, which encourages the use of footwear, and these inhibit callus formation, which makes it increasingly difficult to go barefoot so you end up having to wear shoes all the time. Another drawback is that shoes limit sensory perception. When the foot comes into contact with the ground, the skin, ligaments, tendons and nerves of the foot feed a rich source of information to the brain and spinal cord about the exact position of our foot and the tension, stretch and pressure in our ligaments, tendons, joint capsules and muscles. Essentially, footwear can alter our neuromuscular control patterns and subsequently our movement biomechanics. A return to barefoot running recently emerged as a subculture, with interest having been ignited in 2009 by the best selling book Born to Run, which was about an ultramarathon in a remote region of northern Mexico, but which also argued that running shoes cause injury. The popularity of minimalist shoes, such as the Nike Free and Vibram Five Fingers, has further fueled the debate about whether we should ditch the maximalist shoe that first became popular in the 70s with its larger stack height and raised heel. Of all the parts of a shoe, the part that is most likely to affect your running biomechanics is the heel. The heel is the first part of the body or shoe to hit the ground when you walk and often when you run. This collision generates a rapid spike of force on the ground, known as an impact peak. Impact peaks can equal the force of your body's mass when walking and can be up to three times that when running. The impact peak sends a shockwave of force up your legs and spine, but a significant amount of the impact peak force is dissipated in tissues around the heel. Specifically, the fat pad underneath your heel bone your calcaneus, absorbs the impact peak forces enough to make barefoot walking comfortable. But when it comes to running barefoot, a rear foot strike pattern, where the first part of the foot to come in contact with the ground is the heel, can become painful because the fat pad quickly becomes inflamed with repeated impact. Running shoes with thick, cushioned heels made from elastic materials slow down and soften each impact peak making rear foot heel striking more comfortable and sustainable over long distances. When running barefoot, you can actually avoid the sudden impact peak if you land on the ball of the foot before bringing down the heel in what is known as a forefoot strike. A forefoot strike pattern involves a preparatory stiffening of your ankle and foot complex. When your forefoot strikes the ground, your Achilles tendon and calf muscles absorb the force of the impact storing it as potential energy and releasing it during the latter part of stance. By landing gently on the forefoot or sometimes on the midfoot, you can run fast on hard surfaces without any cushioning 
because you don't generate a sudden sharp impact peak as far as your foot is concerned. Studies evaluating the biomechanical profiles of people who have grown up barefoot or who frequently train with minimalist footwear with no heel cushioning show how these groups tend to forefoot or midfoot strike when running long distances on hard or uneven surfaces. These runners also have a higher cadence and more vertically oriented shins, enabling the ankle to plantar flex in preparation for that forefoot strike pattern. Among marathoners, a number of studies have shown that the majority, about 75%, of recreational endurance runners who habitually wear shoes will strike the ground with their heel first. But in elite groups, a larger proportion are midfoot or forefoot strikers. A conclusion from this could be that better runners are more likely to be midfoot or forefoot strikers, and this must therefore be good for performance and minimizing the risk of injury. But there is a confounding factor at play here, speed. The top finishers in the marathon will be running a lot faster than the bulk of the field. And when we run faster, we are more likely to shift to a four foot strike running style anyway. Elite marathoners run at an average speed of around 20 kilometers per hour, the equivalent of running 100 meters in 18 seconds, 420 times back to back. So it is no surprise that most of them don't strike the ground with their heels. Most people don't have the muscular or physiological capacity to maintain this sort of pace for 26.2 miles, and pace and foot strike pattern are intrinsically linked. There are also a number of advantages to rear foot striking. Firstly, heel striking also allows you to lengthen your stride easily and is easier on your calf muscles and Achilles tendons require them to work less hard to store and release energy. Also, the thick heels and many running shoes actually make it difficult not to heel strike. Maximalist running shoes with big cushioned heels also lower the barrier for entry for a large proportion of people who have spent most of their lives being sedentary to take up running. Novice runners who have yet to develop optimal running form can leverage cushioned shoes to run in a less biomechanically demanding way, hitting the ground hard with every step in a rear foot strike pattern, relying on the shoe to do the work that their neuromuscular systems are not yet capable of. So if you are a novice runner and, for example, you immediately increase your training volume to 40 kilometers a week, each of your legs will experience about a million forceful impacts per year. These impacts can be damaging. Studies have shown that runners who generate higher, more rapid impact peaks are significantly more likely to accumulate repetitive stress injuries in their feet, shins, knees, and lower back. Your running biomechanics, and therefore your shoes, can be linked to this. For instance, in one study, rear foot strikers were injured more than twice as frequently as four foot strikers. One of the most common issues is flat feet, which occurs when the foot arch either doesn't develop or collapses. One study based in the US found that about 25% of Americans have flat feet and are more likely to suffer from discomfort and sometimes injury because a fallen arch changes the way the lower limb works, altering biomechanics further up the kinetic chain at the ankle, the knee and the hip. Strong intrinsic foot musculature helps to create and maintain the shape of the foot's arch. So removing the stimulus that helps these muscles develop increases your risk for flat footedness. Studies that compare habitually barefoot and shod people have found that barefoot people almost never had flat feet, but instead have much more consistently shaped arches, neither low nor high. Another related and common problem that has been associated with wearing shoes is plantar fasciitis or plantar fasciopathy. Plantar fasciitis develops when there is inflammation and degeneration of the plantar fascia. The pathogenesis of plantar fasciitis is multifactorial and complex, but one way it develops is when the muscles of the foot's arch become weak and the fascia has to compensate, maintaining the arch of the foot while storing and releasing energy during stance. The fascia is not well designed for this much stress and can begin to break down and become inflamed and painful. A cycle of dependence can then begin. Often, people with plantar fasciitis seeking relief will be prescribed footwear or orthotics that provide even more support, further offloading the weak structures. 
This may relieve symptoms initially, but if their use is not discontinued, they can create a pernicious feedback loop because they don't prevent the problem from occurring and instead eventually allow the muscles of the foot to become even weaker. Consequently, people who wear orthotics can become increasingly reliant on them. Other aspects of shoes also lead to problems. For example, narrow toe boxes unnaturally squeeze the front of the foot and contribute to common problems such as hallux valgus or bunions, misaligned toes and hammer toes. High heels show off a person's calves, but they disrupt normal posture, shortening the calf muscles and subject the first ray of the foot, the arch and even the knee to abnormal forces that can cause injury. Encasing feet all day in leather or plastic is also commonly considered hygienic but actually creates a sweaty, warm, oxygen-free environment ideal for many funguses and bacteria that cause irritating infections such as athlete's foot. The upshot of all of this is that shoes may play a role in many mismatched conditions. Modern shoes, those designed for a combination of comfort and style, can interfere substantially with the foot's natural functions. So should we go back to the minimalist style of footwear? Not if you want to break world records in athletics. Spikes give track athletes the traction they need to propel themselves forward at a rate that could not be matched when barefoot. And when it comes to long distance running, there has been a recent surge in the development and release of new super shoes, which combine a maximalist design with large amounts of springy cushioning and lightweight but stiff materials like carbon fiber plates. This started in 2016 with Nike's Vaporfly 4% culminating in the first unofficial sub two-hour marathon in 2019. Whatever about injury risk or altering biomechanics, the reason shoes like the Vaporfly have become so popular is because they work from a performance standpoint. World records and personal bests are being shattered across the spectrum of elite to recreational athletes at the moment. And although running barefoot or with minimalist shoes is gaining popularity, Few controlled studies of these approaches to running have been performed, so it's not clear what effects they might have on performance or injury rates. One of the few randomized trials of minimalist running shoes found that greater body mass and higher mileage appear to increase the risk of injury. In this trial, 61 trained runners with a rear foot strike pattern were randomly assigned to minimalist or standard running shoes, and then gradually increased the time spent running in their designated shoes over 26 weeks. Of the 27 injuries sustained, 16 occurred in runners using minimalist shoes. Injury risk was increased among runners with increased body mass using minimalist shoes. This demonstrates that transitioning over to a barefoot or minimalist style of running can be risky, particularly if you have spent your whole life wearing cushioned maximalist style shoes.